where were we five years ago? As I started to work on this talk, I started to think a little bit about that and that QD forum in 2014 um, and even to the year before in 2013 when we saw the first QD implementations come to market. That was the Sony Triluminous uh, set um, lineup and the Kindle Fire uh, HDX. Um, at that time, you know, quantum dots were really an unproven technology. There was no long-term reliability studies about what these things were going to do in the field. People had a lot of concerns about stability. People had a lot of concerns about the need for packaging them in these inert environments, such as having them sealed in glass. Uh, there were heavy metal issues. People were very concerned about the life cycle uh, attributes of what the heavy metals were going to mean in terms of product life cycle and, and recycling, but also in terms of any toxicity or potential toxicity that these materials might represent. And there was concerns about cost. These were hot injection, small scale, three liter, five liter materials. Um, I know that at Nanosys we made all the materials that were used in that initial Kindle Fire product launch on three and five liter glassware reactors, which is just crazy for me to think back about the fact that we had 60 people uh, running in our manufacturing area making these materials at that scale. Um, so, you know, could a technology that required such kind of uh, small batch manufacturing ever scale up? This is a big question that I think everybody was wondering. And if we flash forward now, though, um, where we are today with quantum dots, there's really no doubt that uh, this technology has reached a level of commercial success. Um, it's, as we enter 2019, we expect that this year will mark the year when a cumulative of more than 10 million displays will sh have shipped to the market using quantum dot technology. Uh, we're seeing the expansion rate of quantum dots dwarf uh, all the other technologies that are out there. Of, over, of all the quantum dot materials that we shipped in 2015, 2018 last year, over 85% of those materials were heavy metal free. Um, and uh, we're able to pass all the Rojas exemption requirements. And those five liter reactors that we had in 2013 have been replaced by 1,250 liter reactors now. And those large steel reactors turn out more quantum dots in one batch than we turned out in the entire year of 2013. So scaling has been uh, addressed. Cost has been brought down. Uh, the heavy metal issue has been dealt with and obviously massive deployments have happened. So, you know, what does that look like in terms of the industry? Uh, well, obviously progress has allowed for massive proliferation of displays from seven inches all the way up to 98 inch displays. We've seen the implementations go from requiring this high WVTR barrier films and glass to a lot of other types of packaging formats. Now we have on chip, implementations using quantum dots. We have uh, on glass, thin films using quantum dots. For example, the HP Pavilion 27 product shown up here uh, uses a 10 micron thin QD film uh, on a Corning Iris glass light guide plate, uh, which enables the overall desktop monitor to have an overall thickness that's thinner at a 27 inch monitor than your iPhone, which is really just a phenomenal form factor advantage. When we think about um, what we saw at CES, in total, 11 CE brands showed quantum dot enabled displays, uh, over 68 products on display, almost double the number of products that we saw last year. Um, and, uh, you know, again, phenomenal in terms of the price points that quantum dots have been able to achieve now. We see quantum dot enabled televisions at 43 inches which is a very consumer price point friendly uh, size. And with price points, they're coming down to below $400 per set this year. So this really starts to become a very mainstream way in which high wide color gamut, brightness, high dynamic range are brought to the consumer. And this is really, really very exciting for us in the quantum dot industry. And despite massive investments in white OLED, um, in capital, which is a lot of new plant and a lot of new technology. Um, due to the superior benefits, especially cost benefits, brightness, and overall color performance, 
DFCC forecasts that Quantum Dot will continue to outsell OLED t in the TV category um, indefinitely into the future. Uh, with over 20 million QD TVs forecasted to ship in the near future, as I prepared this talk, I began to wonder um, why has QD been so successful? I mean, obviously, I think I know a little bit about that, but I really came to the conclusion that as far as we're aware, I think this is as close as we have, uh, quantum dot materials are as close as we have in 2019 to the perfect emitter material. So we're all familiar with the outstanding spectrum engineering that these uh, materials provide, um, and thanks to their unique use of quantum confinement. Uh, when other emitters, such as uh, organic materials, return to the ground state to give off light, there's other side effects that happen, like molecular vibration, or rotation, and as a result, those introduce energy loss, which is reflected in a wider spectrum. We don't see that with quantum dots. In addition, to change the frequency of emission uh, for other materials, we have to completely change the material system. We have to redesign the molecules versus changing the synthetic conditions that are used for making quantum dots using the same material set because of this unique quantum confinement effect that we have. Quantum dots are also inherently stable, um, and they do not face, for example, some of the challenges of uh, fast bond cleavage that the host materials in um, phosphorescent OLEDs do. Um, because quantum dot crystals are these nice, neatly ordered, ionically bonded uh, little devices, um, the many ions have much higher formation energy than we see in the covalent bonds um, or dative bonds in, uh, in organic emitters. Um, this leads to this in intrinsically higher stability. Um, quantum dots are also nearly perfect energy converters. They have quantum yields approaching and in some cases maybe even achieving 100% quantum yield. Uh, quantum dots are incredibly bright, which uh, is really important for a lot of applications we're going to hear about today such as how do you get, how do you deliver very high uh, light intensity uh, for the purposes of wound healing. Um, OLED materials are topping out around 10,000 uh, nits uh, in terms of, of brightness and, and show tremendous roll off at higher uh, drive currents, whereas quantum dots have been shown to emit in excess of 100,000 nits uh, due to their lower internal resistance. Um, first, uh, biologic applications, which were, uh, which are still in use today, um, disperse quantum dots in, in the universal solvent, um, uh, H2O. Uh, today we have quantum dots in a variety of media, uh, that allow them to be processed as inks for inkjet printing, uh, photoresists, deposited in acrylates and other types of resins. No need for vacuum or vapor deposition, which gives them unparalleled compatibility with a lot of existing industrial processes and technologies. And thanks to the ramp up in volume and the global supply chain focus on use of quantum dots, um, quantum dots have now achieved price parity and even superiority to some existing phosphor materials, um, which really allows them to be used to meet the price point requirements for a wide range of applications. So last but not least, quantum dots can be used in multiple modes. So we have the photoluminescent mode, which everyone's familiar with, where we're exciting with a high energy photon and down converting. But there's also the electroluminescent mode, such as uh, when we are driving electrons and holes into the quantum dot, as we see in this EL display that I have here. Uh, flexible, printed, um, no, uh, vacuum deposition technology here uh, with this, and uh, welcome to San Diego. Um, very nice and bright, um, and uh, very high efficiency at around 17% EQE. Um, and then also, in going forward in the future, we see them being used extensively in uh, sensing applications and uh, photoelectric conversion, uh, where we're, we're pulling charge out of the photons that are incident on the device. So all of these are reasons why I think quantum dots are really a great material for a wide variety of applications. 
And so far, the display industry has really been the one that's been driving the progress in quantum dots and how quantum dots have evolved in terms of their performance characteristics, their price points, what sorts of wavelengths are necessary, et cetera. Um, but it made me think a little bit about, as I put the talk together today, where else are these materials going to be used and what else has this supply chain that's been developed for quantum dot materials really uh, brought forward in terms of possibilities for other apps. And so there are many, actually. And so we have uh, collaborations and work with a number of different people in new application areas. One that's very exciting is Smart Windows. Smart Windows is an application where today you have a window tint, which is basically knocking down the brightness uh, of the incoming light from outside. Instead, you can replace that with quantum dot materials. And then TIR, that uh, light that's converted or down-converted by the quantum dots to the edge of the glass where it can be harvested by a very high-efficiency solar collector. Um, these, this application is really interesting and, again, requires the types of things that we've developed as a result of working in the display industry, micro-patterning of quantum dots, uh, very high efficiency. Um, we can see up here, you know, the... Uh, uh, Interesting quote from uh, Dr. Alavisados recently, quantum dots are so efficient that existing measurements were not capable of quantifying just how good they are. They may someday enable applications that require materials with luminescent efficiencies well above 99%, most of which haven't been invented yet. And so, you know, 99% uh, efficiency of conversion of that outdoor light into harvestable light at the edge of a smart window is really a very, very uh, great performance that can enable these smart windows to potentially someday self-power the buildings that they're in. In addition, we have uh, the ability to use quantum dots for their spectrum engineering capabilities to form multi-junction or tandem junction types of devices that can uh, harvest the spectrum more efficiently than we get out of a single uh, junction type device um, and a lot of great work going into this as well in the research areas. Um, price points need, needed for solar are have now reached about 60 cents a watt and yet it's not good enough. That needs to come down to less than 15 cents a watt to really reach the kind of widespread deployment that's necessary in order to meet the greenhouse gas um, emission specifications. And so this is really uh, a technology that can hopefully enable that to happen by improving the efficiency of collection for the existing solar technologies that are out there. We're very excited about that. We also have um, you know, that application we talked about at the beginning, I think the original application for quantum dots in a commercial sense, which was tagants. And so because quantum dots are so very small, and they're so very bright, and easily distinguishable, we can put them onto molecules, we can put them onto antigens, we can use them in a variety of ways to actually identify particular specimens and sample them, and then be able to track them throughout certain processes. So a recent paper was published, and this is a, a problem that's over 200 years old. How do bees actually do their pollination? Well, scientists were able to tag uh, pollen with quantum dots and then have different, different tags on different types of plants and be able to track where the bees actually went out in the field when they returned back to the hive. They would have different concentrations of different colors of quantum dots on them. And while this technology has been in use for a while in, uh, in vitro applications, the, the development of Heavy metal free quantum dots really opens up a tremendous number of new applications for this in uh, actual in vivo types of applications because of the reduction in toxicity. In addition to that one, we've got uh, the uh, uh, idea of doing conversion of daylight spectrum into something that's more efficient for growing uh, plants. And you're going to hear about this during the conference as well, I believe. So. The inbound spectrum coming is very broadband, and plants actually don't absorb green light very well. So can we take that green light and shift it into the red spectrum and thereby enhance 
the overall growth cycle, creating more of a late afternoon sun type of illumination throughout the day in the greenhouse. And a lot of it, uh, great work on this. We're absolutely going to need to produce more food to feed the roughly 10 billion people that are going to be on the planet by 2050. And this technology is something that we're uh, optimistic can help to make that happen. Also greenhouse lighting. So for those areas where you've got very poor daylight uh, cycles, such as the very northern, very southern climates, um, magenta light is the thing that everyone's now studying. You're going to hear some talks today about the use of uh, red and blue light and how that can affect uh, plant growth to be more effective. Again, quantum dots are a really excellent way to convert that blue light energy into red. So you have your nice gallium nitride blue emitter and your nice red quantum dot that can be pushed out in terms of emission wavelength very far to where the plants really like it at around 650, 655 nanometers. And this in turn creates a, a real nice efficiency in terms of growing and reduces the overall power consumption because in uh, traditional greenhouse lighting, you've got a lot of wasted heat energy because you're creating green light energy which is not being used by the plants and it's just causing heat without actually causing growth. Smart lighting. Um, smart lighting is, is really fantastic. If we look at uh, plants, you know, plants need sunlight and water. It turns out humans are just kind of, you know, house plants with complex emotions. We need sunlight too. And if we don't get sunlight, you know, uh, our bodies suffer. We basically end up in positions where we have all sorts of diseases and disease functions happen because our sleep patterns get interrupted. And without the good sleep, we then in turn don't wind up with good recovery. So being able to create daylight types of, sun, of uh, spectrum in our office environments is really a very effective way to improve employee health and, and get us all out into the sunlight even though we work indoors. Um, so this type of circadian lighting and circadian uh, type of illumination is also something that we see that quantum dots can really help with because of their ability to create this multispectral, broad spectral uh, kind of response in those uh, lighting applications. Photomedicine. So again, if we're going to talk about, you know, how do we do photomedicine if we have a uh, very high brightness intensity, very low cost uh, film, which is able to be placed directly on the patient um, at the site where we have a wound and we want to do wound care, we can bring this very high illumination uh, directly onto the wound without needing to have this kind of setup that we see here today, which is how this is done uh, for uh, skin treatments and, and wound healing uh, already. So high intensity, again, a unique capability of quantum dots, very high brightness, um, no other material out there that is really good for making these types of very high brightness uh, EL emitter type devices. And last but not least, sensors. Um, so sensors are, of course, uh, great. We all have them in our cameras. I was fortunate to be uh, part of the development of the optical mouse sensor. Uh, that's out there and, and all of the mice that we all use. Um, but there's limitations. There's speed. Um, the sensors aren't that fast, so we have rolling shutter effects. Um, and they're not very sensitive in certain spectra. So if we want to have sensitivity out in the infrared, silicon's not that great. Um, but quantum dots can be used as a, as a photo detection layer. They can, they're solution processable, so they're easily deposited onto silicon wafers, which have those detection circuits built in. And now you can basically create a very high infrared, for example, sensitivity sensor using a spin coating process on top of an existing CMOS process, uh, which has a very, very fast, no rolling shutter sort of response. So again, very unique characteristics that only quantum dots can provide. We also have to be very conscious about responsible development as we go through. Obviously, we've uh, seen a lot of issues around uh, the use of heavy metals, and we have abated that now through quantum dot development over the last five years, and we need to just be sure we continue to responsibly develop these materials so we don't leave uh, 
planet that basically has recycling problems with heavy metals. So where is all of this taking us? That's kind of a, a big question that um, you know, I, was, I was curious about. And hopefully out of this uh, conference, I'll come out with, uh, and we'll all come out with, a little bit better idea of exactly where, where we're headed. One thing that I did in my career for starting about 30 years ago was I, I've worked in the semiconductor industry extensively. And back in 1988, uh, when I got started, um, semiconductor industry was very, very um, fragmented is probably the best way to say it. So lots of people were working on lots of different processes. There were lots of arguments about which technologies would win. Were bipolar circuits faster than CMOS circuits? Were, did we need gallium arsenide? There was a lot of different ideas about what the future circuit technologies were going to be. The SAIA roadmap, though, basically was the thing that really generated a uh, coming together for the industry around what the technology nodes needed to be and how those things needed to move forward over time. Now, what this did was it got everyone on the same page, tool makers, application developers, uh, raw material suppliers, uh, manufacturers, etc. And within a very short period of time, this SAA roadmap, which has gone through 18 revisions since, basically led us to the development of technologies down to 65 nanometer, and then ultimately where we are now to 7 nanometer. And this 7 nanometer CMOS technology I don't think would have been possible if the industry didn't get together and work together as a cohesive unit towards driving into particular directions that included involving academia and all the interested parties. And when you know, we look at what that enabled, we can see that you know, back in 1990, I had this big, heavy kind of notebook, um, which was great because I never had a mobile product before because power consumption was too high in notebooks. And eventually this led to gaming computers and a lot of other things, and miniaturization led to ultimately very, very fast compute power, which ultimately led to you know, the most prolific device on the planet, um, technology device on the planet with, this, with the smartphone. Um, all of this was really enabled by this SIA roadmap of technology without that seven nanometer technology, uh, or 10 nanometer technology we have today, we wouldn't be able to make the iPhone in its current form factor, for example, with the speeds that it has, sorry, or the Samsung Galaxy, I, I have to give equal airtime. Um, and, you know, this uh, basically is, is a kind of uh, something I think we can learn from. Because when we look at quantum dots, quantum dots, the original application, as we said, in that tagant type of, of field, now really driven to be a very large-scale technology through display. But lots of these other new application fields that we can already see emerging, and many of them have new requirements. For example, some of them require infrared, and some of them require uh, performance in uh, an electroluminescent uh, type of application versus a phosphorescent or a fluorescent application. And so all of these uh, requirements can help drive us towards technology development for quantum dots as an industry uh, that ultimately, who knows, where this technology can be used. Um, so. I did a little uh, summary chart here of just kind of looking back to 2013 and where we were in terms of technology and where we are here in 2019. Now, I don't have the answers as far as how to populate the roadmap going forward, and I hope that out of the discussions that I'm going to have here at the conference, I'll be able to get a little bit better idea about what exactly the quantum dot materials are that some of our partners who are developing a lot of these new applications are really going to need. Um, but for example, if we look back to 19, uh, or sorry, 2013, we can see we had CAD selenide, and CAD selenide was the dominant technology, in fact, the only technology that was shipping in terms of the cores. And now indium phosphide core shell shell structure is the dominant technology that's shipping into the marketplace. Full width half max for the CAD selenide back in that time frame was 35 nanometers, and it's kind of unbelievable, but we've gotten indium phosphide now down to 33 nanometers. So five years later, we actually have you know full width half max performance comparable to where we started when we deployed CAD selenide originally. 
Wavelength range still in the visible, 519 to 645, which is very good. Um, minimum layer thickness, though, when we started with these materials, they were very, they needed to be because we didn't really fully understand all the elements around lifetime and durability. They needed to be deployed in very thick layers, and there were very sparse populations within those thick layers. Now we have very high density layers with very, in very, very thin films, and these are used for a variety of new applications like color conversion not just doing white light um, spectrum creation. Pattern ability, we've actually been able to pattern our quantum dots down to 65 nanometers, um, which is really, again, micro patterning can be very useful in terms of technology deployment for certain applications. Um, and ink jetting, we've been able to ink jet these materials down to 20 nanometers, and I think the materials actually are quite capable to go well below that. But the inkjet technology as of today is really only capable of, of hitting in that range with uh, accuracy and repeatability. Um, device lifetime's great. Um, we see our EL device lifetime now. We didn't, isn't even really something we thought about in the uh, 2013 timeframe. Uh, with cadmium-free 17% EQE uh, devices now uh, on the EL side, we're at 200 hours, which is a far cry from where they need to be in terms of a display device, but still very good if you think about what can I do with a 200-hour lifetime device that can output 100,000 nits. You know, there may be other applications besides display uh, that, that can use this technology, which is being the development of which is being driven by the display industry. Um, high, very high efficiency, 93% uh, absolute quantum yield uh, for indium phosphide today. We didn't really even measure absolute quantum yield uh, back in 2013. We, we had a lot of dilute quantum yield measurements. Um, when we think about uh, the absorption of, uh, for PL conversion, uh, CAD selenide, uh, in terms of the measure that we use of OD per mass, um, was around, is around 0.9. And today, our uh, red indium phosphide is at 0.8. So very good blue absorption uh, with a very high quantum yield leads to you know, color conversion efficiencies up in the 35%, and, and we're pushing towards 40. And perhaps most notably, you know, cost has basically come down in terms of cost uh, for uh, selling price for quantum dots from over $300 a gram to a price point that's less than phosphor at $12 a gram now. And in addition to that, because of the increased efficiency and better light management that we've been able to put in place, we're using fewer quantum dots uh, per unit area. All of this is really driven those economics and performance characteristics that have allowed deployment in $400 TVs with wide color gamut, very bright, uh, consumer experiences, and you know, I'm very interested to know what we need to do next in terms of developing materials for that next set of applications. And uh, I look forward to hearing about some of those next set of applications throughout the rest of the two days here. Thank you very much.